This is a talk on solving equations by factoring. So let's get started with a question. Let's say I give you two boxes and I want you to put either one number in the same box or two numbers in different boxes. The numbers could be positive, negative, decimals, fractions, whatever numbers you want to come up with. There's one restriction. The restriction is that the number cannot be zero or any version of it. So you cannot pick five minus five because five minus five is zero. And you cannot pick zero to go into either box. So your task is to see if you can come up with one number to go here, one number to go here, or the same number to go in both. But the product, when you multiply those two boxes or the numbers in those two boxes, you should get zero. So take a minute, pause the video, think about the problem, and then come back uh, maybe after a minute of thinking and seeing if you can come up with a pair of numbers or a single number that makes this happen. So hopefully you thought about it and recognized that this is not actually possible. And the reason why this is not possible is because no matter what you do, it's not possible to come up with numbers that you multiply and get zero as the product, unless one of the numbers is zero. Or, in fact, both numbers are zero. So either the zero could be here, or the zero could be here, or they both, in fact, could be zero, because that gives a true statement as well. Now, this idea or this notion is known as the zero product property. And sometimes people call it the zero product rule or the zero factor rule. Sometimes it's even called the zero factor property. It all means the same thing. So the rule itself says the following. If you have a product of two or more terms equaling zero, then at least one of the factors must be zero. It's possible two of them or three of them or all of them are zero, and that's okay but at least one of them must be zero. There's no way out without that happening. So if we were to take a look at this example, we have x plus four times x minus three times x plus five. You'll notice that all these are being multiplied, all three terms on the left-hand side. So we have a product of two or more terms equaling zero. This means that either this first term is zero, the second term is zero, or this third term is zero, or two of them are zero, or all three of them are zero. Now, mathematicians don't like uncertainty. So in this case, we take out an insurance policy, meaning we're hedging our bets. We don't know which one of these is going to equal zero. So what we say is, well, either this one is zero, or this one is zero, or this one is zero. And then we just basically say, we're just gonna set zero to all of them, as opposed to trying to figure out which one the zero actually is. So if you set x plus 4 equal to 0, that gives you x equals negative 4. Subtract the 4 over to the other side. If you have x minus 3 equaling 0, we'll add the 3 to the other side, and that gives you x equals 3. And then finally, x plus 5 equals 0. Subtract the 5 to the other side, and you get x equals negative 5. Now these are potential solutions, or these are answers to this problem, but that does not mean that they are solutions to the equation. So you should always, always, always check your answers in the original problem that you were given to see if the answers that you got by solving the equation are indeed solutions to it. And in this case, negative four, if you were to plug in here, it will give you zero. Zero times anything would give you zero. So we know this is a solution. Three minus three would give you a zero and zero times anything would give you a zero as well. And then similarly for negative five, negative five plus five is zero. Zero times anything would always give you zero. So in this case, we just verified very quickly that all three are indeed solutions to this equation. The next thing I want you to note is the difference between an expression and an equation. Every single problem that we've done so far in chapter five and chapter six, they've all been expressions because there was no equal given in the problem. So an algebraic expression is simply a collection of terms, either sums or differences. They could be products or quotients as well, but more often than not, they're sums or differences, meaning either a plus or a minus sign. Expressions like these can be simplified or factored. Those are the only two questions you can ask about an expression in this context. Now, when we talk about equations, equations are things that can be solved. 
And the way you determine if something is an equation or an expression, well, you look to see if it has an equal sign in the problem. So here we have 3x squared plus 4x plus 5. Well, this is simply an expression. This could be factored into 2 using any of the factoring techniques we've learned in the past. This, on the other hand, is an equation that needs to be solved. And if we go back to the title of our talk, Solving Equations by Factoring or With Factoring, well, we're going to talk about solving these equations, something like this, by using factoring as a technique to help us move along. And that's one of the biggest reasons for why we need to learn factoring, because they help us solve equations that are not linear. So how, we, how exactly do we accomplish this? Well, if we want to solve equations by factoring, the first thing you need to accomplish is you need to set one side of the equation equal to zero. And the reason we do this is because then we can use the zero product property and solve for x. Now notice that we call it the zero product property. And the reason we do that is because it only works for zero. There is no five product property. There are 10 product property or 17 product property. Those things don't exist. So there's no 10 product property I mentioned here. So once one side of the equation is equal to zero, well, then you're expected to factor the other side. And this is the part where you're really using factoring to solve equations. And once you've done that, well, then you have something that looks like this where you factored the left-hand side, the right-hand side is zero, and now you're using the zero product property on this, which gives you x equals negative four, x equals three, and x equals negative five. So that's basically the application of the zero product property. And then finally, always, always, always check your potential solutions, the answers that you get at the end, to see if they are solutions to the equation or not. And once you get to here, make sure you celebrate. Have a cookie, have a glass of milk, or whatever it is that you fancy at this time. You've achieved one of the top three goals for the semester. Learning how to solve equations by factoring is one of the, the three peaks that we must attain or achieve in this course. So if you're able to do this successfully, you're, you're doing one of the three major, I guess, uh, things that I need you to do for this course. Next, we look at an example. So this is something from start to finish solved using these five or these four principles or four steps. So let's say we're given something that looks like this. Before you start, you should always check to see if what you're given is an expression or if it's an equation. Now the word solve should also give us a hint. Solve is only used for equations because you cannot solve expressions. You can simplify them or you can factor them. You can only solve equations. So in order to start, the first thing we need to do is make one side to be zero or make, make one side zero. So in order to do that, we can take this three and subtract it over to the other side and get four X squared plus X minus three equals zero. Now we have one side of the equation equaling zero. The second step was to factor the left hand side so that we could get it to be products on the one side and a zero on the other. And then the zero product property applies. So here, in order to factor, we go back to our original questions or that chart that I'm hoping you have memorized at this stage. The first thing you should always be thinking of, is there a GCF? And in this case, there isn't one because one of the coefficients is one. Next question we ask is how many terms there are? Well, there's three terms, one, two, three. Well, if there's three terms, the first thing we always think of are the formulas. Well, four X squared is a perfect square but three is not a perfect square and this minus sign is in the wrong spot. So immediately we can say, Hey, formulas are not going to work. That gets crossed out. Next question we ask ourselves with a factoring question is, is a one or is a something besides one? Well, if a is one, which it's not, then we would use the AC method. But since a is not one, we have to use split the middle as a technique. So this essentially gives us the following. If we were to go back and multiply four and negative three to start us off, we would get negative 12. And then factors of negative 12, I'm sure you can figure these out or you can confirm that these are indeed the case. 
And in fact, we need factors of negative 12 that add up to 1. And negative 3 plus 4, the very last factor we wrote, indeed is the one that works. So here is the end of the AC method and the start of the grouping. Hopefully you remember that splitting the middle is a combination of the AC method and grouping. So we split or we rewrite the x as negative 3x plus 4x using the coefficients we got from the AC method. And then we have four terms now in the problem. And hopefully you remember that whenever you have four terms, grouping should immediately pop in your head. So if we were to group this problem into a group of two and then a group of two, we see that we have a GCF of X from the first two terms. So I factor that out. And the moment I factor it out an X or factor anything out for that matter, I open parentheses. And in order to know what goes inside, I divide four X squared by X and that gives me four X. So I put that there and negative three X divided by X gives me a negative three. So that goes right here, close parentheses. Now, remember in grouping, your goal is to make these two parentheses have the same terms inside. So not only does 4x minus three not have a GCF, we already have 4x minus three. So we should just be able to get away with just factoring out a one. We don't need to do any heavy thinking here. If we have exactly the same term or binomial in both parentheses, we're happy. That's exactly what we need. Now, one thing I didn't mention is this equal zero just keeps coming down. We don't need to do anything to that side. And in fact, we cannot just get rid of the zero. So quite frequently, students just start writing the left hand side and stop writing the right hand side. That's incorrect. The reason for that is this is an equation. If you were to take away this equal zero, that would turn this into an expression. That's a no, no. We cannot change the type of the problem we're given midstream. So if we start with an equation, we must end with an equation as well. If we start with an expression, we must end with an expression as well. We cannot just, you know, imagine that there's a zero on one side if it's not given to us. So at this stage, coming back to grouping for this big term and this big term, we see that there's a four X minus three common to both terms. So we factor that out open parentheses. And then from this first term, if we factor out a four X minus three, we're left behind with an X. So the X goes here. From this second term, if we factor out a four X minus three, I'm left with a one. So the one goes there. Now you'll notice I have factored the left hand side and I have a zero on the other side. So I have a product of two terms on one side of the equation equaling zero. And this is our cue to use the zero product property. So we have a product of two terms equaling zero, therefore the zero product property applies. And what that tells us is that this term must either equal zero or this term must equal zero. We don't know which one it is and we don't like taking risks. So we set both of them equal to zero. Hopefully you can confirm without much trouble that X equals three over four and X equals negative one come out to be potential solutions or answers. Now, in order to see if there are solutions or not to the original equation, we have to check our answers in the original equation. So this is what we were given to begin with. And if I replace X with three over four, I get three equals three at the end. And you're welcome to verify the math here. Therefore, the number that I plugged in the three over four, that is proven to be a solution. And similarly, if we were to plug in negative one, which was the other answer into the original equation for X, we also get three equals three. Therefore, X equals negative one is confirmed to be a solution as well. So both these answers turned out to be solutions to this equation. Next, let's look at another example. So we have X minus seven times X plus three equals negative nine. This is already factored, so it's amazing. We can just set X minus seven equal to negative nine, and then we can set X plus three equal to negative nine. So if we set X minus seven equal to negative nine, we can add the seven to the other side, giving us X equals negative two. And then for this other side of the equation, you can subtract the three and get X equals negative 12. Never, ever, 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 ever do this. Never do this. 
The reason why is because we used a negative nine product property. It does not exist. Do not do this. You must, 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 if you wish to solve an equation by factoring, one side of the equation must equal zero, and only then you can factor. So again, we must always set the equation equal to zero and then factor. We cannot set this equal to negative nine and say, well, this first term is equal to negative nine and the second term must equal negative nine as well. This is improper, it's illegal in mathematics, we cannot do this. In fact, this remains what I showed here. This remains to be the most common mistake students make at this level, where they just ignore the fact that there has to be a zero here and they just set each term equal to, to zero or equal to negative nine. So once we move the nine over to the other side, well, then we still have a product of x minus seven and x plus three plus nine equaling zero. Unfortunately, we still cannot use the zero product. And I wrote product in red here because that's an equally important part of this. It cannot just be that you set the equation equal to zero. You also have to have products on the other side of the equation. Everything on the other side of the equation must be a product, not just some piece of it, not just some part of it, but the whole thing has to be a product. Something like this, where everything inside, on the left-hand side, sorry, is a product equaling zero. So if we're to come back to this problem, what we can do is distribute the x minus seven into the x plus three. So x gets multiplied by x minus, uh, x gets multiplied by x plus three, and then negative seven gets multiplied by x plus three as well. And then we have still have a plus nine equaling zero. And when we distribute the x and when we distribute the negative seven, we get the following. Here we can combine like terms, negative 21 and positive nine gives us negative 12. So here, you actually had to come up with the equation that you had to solve first, and then you can solve that equation. So there's a little more stuff to be done at the beginning of the problem, but if you remember the actual conditions that are needed for the zero product property, you will not make a mistake. There's two conditions. One side of the equation must be zero, and the other side of the equation must entirely be products of two or more terms. It doesn't matter if two terms are in product and a third term is not a product. Then you cannot use the zero product property. It's not the zero product and sometimes some property. It's the zero product property. Must have products in order to use it. So we get this equation. Now in order to solve this equation by factoring, well, we look to factor the left-hand side. And in order to factor the left-hand side, we think of factors, or sorry, the greatest common factor there is none because here the coefficient is one. The next question we ask ourselves is how many terms? We have three terms, one, two, three. The formulas don't apply because even though x squared is a perfect square, the signs don't match up with either formula that we could use and 12 is not a perfect square. So the formulas get crossed out, but we do notice that a is one and that means that we can head off into the AC method. So we already had a table for a, uh, 1 times negative 12, which gives us negative 12. We already had a table for negative 12 right here. So from here, we need to find factors that add up to negative 4. Well, 2 minus 6 is negative 4. So in fact, we can use the same thing here. x plus 2 and x minus 6. 2 minus 6 is negative 4, and 2 times negative 6 is negative 12. So the factors, because we were using the AC method, we can go directly to the answer. So now we have a product of two terms, everything is in factored form, equaling 0. Well, this is where the zero product property applies. So I can set this factor equal to 0, x plus 2 equals 0, and I can set this factor equal to zero, x minus six equals zero. Solving these individually, we get x equals negative two or x equals six. 
Again, these are just answers. You must go back and check them in the original equation to see if they end up being solutions or not. Let's take a look at another example. Say we have 18x cubed plus 8x equals negative 24x squared. So we always have to set one side of the equation equal to zero. So I can move this term to the left-hand side, giving me 18x cubed minus 24x squared plus 8x equals zero. And again, think of the GCF first. Always, always, always think of the GCF first. So factoring out the 2x, which is a GCF of all these three terms, we get 9x squared minus 12x plus 4. If you were to divide this term by 2x, this term by 2x, and the last term by 2x, these are the terms that would be left behind. And here, we found the GCF. The next thing is we have three terms left over. Well, if you have three terms, we try the formulas first. So 9x squared is a perfect square. So far, so good. 4 is a perfect square, even better. And we have a plus minus plus. So the signs match as well. So we can use one of the formulas we had for perfect squares. And the way we do that is the GCF again just comes along for the ride. We cannot just get rid of this GCF or forget it for that matter. The square root of, three, of 9x squared is 3x. The square root of 4 is 2. The sign in the middle comes from the sign in the middle term. So that comes there. And we square the whole thing. Now this, at this stage, is a guess. We don't know if the formula works perfectly or not. Remember, we must always check on the middle term, 2 times a times b. So 2 times my guess for a, 2 times 3x, times b, my guess for b. This ends up being 12x, which is indeed our middle term. So the middle term checks out, which means that this factorization is correct. So now instead of writing 3x minus 2, the quantity squared, what I did was I just wrote down the 2x, which was the GCF. And again, do not forget the GCF. I just wrote the 3x minus 2 twice instead of writing a square here. And you'll see why. Equaling 0. So again, we have a product of three things. 2x times 3x minus 2 times 3x minus 2. We have a product of three things equaling 0. We can invoke the zero product property. And this gives us that either 2x is equal to 0, or 3x minus 2 is equal to 0, or 3x minus 2 is equal to 0. Solving this one, we get x equals 0. So that comes here. x equals 0 over 2. 0 over 2 is just 0. And if we were to solve this one, basically these two equations are the same. So one might say, well, why write it down twice? The reason for this is going to be evident when you take college algebra, where we start talking about multiplicity of roots. So x equals 2 thirds is going to be known as a root of this polynomial. And you don't have to know about those words right now, but this root will appear twice. So x equals 2 thirds, one will come from this factor and the other will come from this factor. That's why I'm introducing you to writing this down twice so that when you move on into future courses like college algebra and pre-calc, this is not a surprise to you as, hey, why do we have to write this down twice even if it's the same? Well, because that's the right thing to do. So here, again, we get x equals 0, x equals 2 thirds, and x equals 2 thirds. So the last thing left to do is we have these answers. We must, must, must check them in the original problem to see if they're solutions or not. So I've left that for you to give that a try and see if they do indeed work out. But other than that, every single one of these equations in section 6.7 follows the same exact pattern. And let's review that pattern or the rules once. You have to set one side of the equation equal to zero, because if you do that, then you can use the zero product property after you have factored. So the first step is always set it equal to zero. Step two is factor the other side. And step three is once you have factors on one side and a zero on the other side, use the zero product property. Once you have potential solutions from there, check your potential solutions in the original equation to see if they end up being solutions or not. And that's basically it. But here is where you're going to have to need 
extreme comfort with factoring techniques. So everything that we've done so far basically gets combined into this one section. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.